The 2020 census is coming. Make sure everyone gets counted. Do you hate waiting in lines? Have nothing to do? Get impatient? Hate waiting for the doctor? Run out of cat memes to look at? Add some excitement to your life. On April 1st, go to census.gov while you wait. Do it while drinking coffee, while enjoying dessert. Tell a friend, maybe not at work. In bed, anywhere you feel like. On April 1st, join us. Log on to census.org and be counted. summer of 2018, Peoria Unified School District um, received some communication from Glendale Community College saying that their Child Development Center was empty and wanting to know if we would be interested in partnering with them to run the Child Development Center. This partnership has been pretty awesome for the preschool because we've gotten the chance to work with a lot of the new workforce that's coming up through the college. So all the interns that have been coming in and all the people that attend GCC now all know that Peoria does have preschool program and we have a toddler program now. Our success rate is um, has been serving students and serving the community. We have um, a wonderful preschool here on campus that we have approximately 12 children that are attending the preschool. Our toddler side, we have two toddlers, so we do have open enrollment at this time. The teachers on campus here that are um, in the classroom are actual GCC graduates, so I like to say that they actually have been my students. They have graduated from the program of early childhood education, and now that they are actually working for Peoria Unified School district. One of the, the great advantages of this partnership with Glendale Community College are the interns that are coming into the program. We have students who um, are in the early childhood program at Glendale Community College who come into the toddler and preschool rooms. So my students that are going into early childhood education sees the uh, lab here on campus as an added benefit to prepare them to become workforce ready and to see best practices when it comes to early childhood education. And what, and what color is this? Currently, all preschool programs um, in Peoria School District are voluntarily enrolled in Quality First. We currently have um, one three-star center, eight four-star centers, and eight five-star centers. Um, there are ten in the region, and we hold eight of those five-star programs. Parents are very happy. We have uh, several staff members and um, instructors that are bringing their children here and they've seen the growth, they've seen how their child is thriving, and they're seeing the um, collaboration with the teachers that are working together with their children. We've had lots of positive feedback. We've had families say their children love to come to school each day, but their previous place they didn't necessarily like it as much. What I want to make sure everybody knows is that preschool really does hit on the whole child, so everything from their motor development to their cognitive development and their emotional development, so it's an all-encompassing type program to help everybody learn. If parents are interested in registering for preschool or toddler programs, they can reach out to the uh, preschool registration office at Skyview Elementary School. The number is 623-773-6675. We do still have some availability. Welcome back to Arizona's favorite game show, What You Give, You Get. The only show that answers the age-old question, what's a public school tax credit and how do I get it? Remember, the rules of the game are simple. Individuals may claim a non-refundable tax credit for making a donation or paying a fee to your local school to support eligible activities or programs. Joint filers are allowed up to $400 credit or $200 for single or separate filers. And those credits reduce your tax liability dollar for dollar. Owe $500 in taxes and make a qualifying $200 donation? Your tax bill is now $300. And if your donation is larger than your tax bill, the remaining tax credit can roll over for up to five years. Now let's get ready to play What You Give, You Get Lightning Round, tax credit or not. The rules are simple. I'll give you a possible donation, and you tell me if it qualifies for the public school tax credit. 
Here we go. First up, athletic participation fees. Correct, that's a tax credit. Academic field trip fee. Correct, that's a tax credit. Money for band instruments. Correct, that's a tax credit. Fees for out-of-state competition. Correct, that's a tax credit. Money for a school's greatest need. Correct, that's a tax credit. Donate money even if you don't have a child in our schools. Correct, that's a tax credit. Credit is available to all individual filers. Congratulations on lowering your tax bill by supporting Peoria Unified Schools. Remember, what you give, you get. For more information on the Public School Tax Credit Program or to make an online donation, please visit our website at www.peoriaunified.org slash tax credit. Beginning in March, the U.S. Census Bureau will invite households across the country to participate in the 2020 Census. But what is the Census? Simply put, the Census is a headcount of every person living in the United States. To be sure the government represents the people, the U.S. Constitution requires a population count every 10 years. Ever since 1790, the Census has determined the number of seats each state receives in the U.S. House of Representatives. It is, and always has been, a cornerstone of our democracy. We still use it to determine representation, but leaders also use the data to make decisions. Your response helps guide planning for the future of our communities. The 2020 Census will help inform decisions on how billions of dollars are allocated annually for critical public services like roads, schools, hospitals and health care clinics, fire and emergency response services, and hundreds of other programs. In 2020, for the first time, you'll be able to complete the census online, by phone or by mail. It asks a few simple questions, like how many people live in your home on April 1st, including their age and sex, and if there are any children living there. You should know that by law, all census responses are completely confidential and your personal information cannot be shared with any law enforcement agencies. Every person counts, no matter who you are or where you live. So whether your family has participated for decades or the 2020 census will be your first, we all have a role in shaping the future of our country. Welcome to this beautiful space. Well, I know many of the guests, when you, you signed in to join us for this event, you shared such fond memories of this space and what it was, and we're just so looking forward to this next chapter and what it has truly become. Uh, I believe there are just many that, that remember, of course, the Challenger Space Shuttle and that fateful day uh, when it broke apart in the midst of its flight, uh, killing all seven of those crew members that were on board. This building opened in 1996 and became really a hub of the community here in North Peoria, serving as both a museum uh, and an activity center, really all centered around human flight. And you can see um, much of that here still today that we have uh, preserved and to become really uh, a work of art that will continue on into the future. It's really fitting that we're surrounded by this piece of art uh, and that we're transitioning from, from what it was as a center of flight into what it is now going to become and kind of this new mission and this next French frontier that this space will have uh, as a place of art and innovation. So we're just so pleased that you could all be here with us today. The Peoria Unified School District is steadfast in its commitment to ensuring a thriving community and a society of great character. This is realized through nurturing the creativity of our youth, promoting innovation and fostering learning and work environments that are inspiring, safe, and supportive. The development of the PUSD Smart Center is a testament to this very intentional mindset and the district's commitment to student success through the arts. Right. We're ready to make it official, so representing our past. 
please welcome up our former superintendent, Dr. Denton Santorelli. He served Peoria Unified School District for more than 30 years. Joining him will be our current superintendent, Mrs. Pallas Thompson, representing our present and leading us into the next chapter starting July 1st, 2020. Please welcome our soon to be new superintendent, Dr. Jason Reynolds.
How's everybody? We are going to reconvene our public session. Uh, no, I think we're okay. All right, so we'd like to move to our moment of silence and the Pledge of Allegiance, which who we will be led by Hayden Gardner of Centennial High School, a senior there. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Just a, a quick housekeeping note. If there is anybody who wishes to speak, during the public speak session, there is a table outside with green, or I'm sorry, right over there next to that wall with green slips. Uh, please fill one of those out and hand it over to the table over here and we'll get it up front and uh, we'll give you your time. That said, uh, moving on to uh, 5.1, address the agenda and consider adoption or recommended changes. Uh, board? Go with that. All right, moving along to staff recognition, 6.1. All right, uh, board comments, 6.2. Ms. Seha. Well, uh, thank you, President Sandoval. It's so great to be here. Welcome, everybody. I had um, the opportunity to join Centennial High School's campus and engage with students with uh, dialogue. And the kudos to them, the amount of professionalism and respect that they have in voicing their opinions and advocacy. I just want to say thank you to that campus for for uh, doing that with such class, um, and a leadership team for joining me on that conversation. At this point, that was it. Thank right. you. Thank you. Ms. Underhill? Yes, I would concur. It was really nice to meet with the students and talk with them and just learn from them, and it's amazing, um, their professionalism at their age. So it was a really valuable experience. Um, I also have to give a shout out to Sunrise Mountain's girls basketball team for their big win last night in the playoffs, and they're heading to ASU for the final next Monday at 6 o'clock. Thank you. Perfect. Ms. Dow? I don't have anything. Thank you. Okay. Yes, so uh, earlier this week, I had the opportunity to um, attend the Peoria High School versus St. Mary's basketball game. And, uh, um, you know, it's just, it, it's, again, it's, it's exciting to me to not only watch uh, the teams, you know, play together um, uh, as team members, and, uh, but the sportsmanship that's displayed, uh, again, the teamwork, um, the camaraderie is just uh, inspiring. But uh, so Peoria uh, did uh, come away with a win. And they'll be going to the state finals on Saturday. So uh, congratulations to the uh, Peoria Panthers. Uh, Ms. Pingarelli, anything? Uh, you good? No. Okay. Superintendent comments? Yes, please. Um, last Thursday, we held our first reunification drill. And, and I know you've, some of you heard about it. Our safety team worked with our Peoria police to create a mock scenario that involved transporting Oakwood 7th and 8th grade students to CCV where they were reunited with the parents. I want to thank the staff, certainly our staff, but CCV's staff, amazing, amazing. Thank you so very much. Um, we also hosted uh, the Maricopa County Regional Spelling Bee, and this, this, this was this past weekend, and I'm pleased to report that, okay, and I'm, I can't spell his name, okay, Joash Ismas from Oasis Elementary and Raja Balanan from Sun Valley Elementary will be advancing to the state spelling bee that will take place next month. Really cool, really amazing. That's so, great news. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Yes, that's it. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. The next line item is public comment. So uh, just, uh, again, a little housekeeping. So our public comment is set for three minutes per individual. So if uh, each individual can uh, respect that time limit, which respects others who wish to speak, um, I certainly appreciate that. That said, the first individual up is Mr. Hal Borhauer. Thank you. 
President Sandoval, members of the board, <clears throat> Superintendent uh, Lopez, uh, Palace Thompson, members of the cabinet, public. My name is Hal Borhauer. I'm a proud resident of Peoria. And nobody's going to talk about Ironwood playing tonight? Somebody over there going to give us an update on the score? <laughs> okay, keep track of Ironwood. <clears throat> you guys just forgot them. <laughs> I'm here again to talk about money for CTE programs. Uh, I talked a little bit the last time I was here about some money that was swept from a CTE account at Liberty. I now have one $80,000 one that was swept from a CTE program at Kellis. Now, I understand there's a state statute that if CTE, CTE program in a district has over $100,000 in their accounts at the end of the year, that the, <coughs> the, the overage over $100,000 is swept. But that's at the end of a fiscal year. That's not in the, in, the middle of a school year. So I'm a detective by trade, so let's ask questions. Patty Beltram, don't know anything about it. Marco Marino, the teacher, don't know anything about it. I don't know why. Jeff Wooten, principal, you must know why they swept $80,000 from a fund at your school. Doesn't know anything about it. So my point is, as a board, there's policies, there's agendas, and there's staff, and you have a superintendent. And I would think, as a board, you would want to know if $80,000 is swept from a fund that the students raised this year, why and where it went. So that's my request as a board that you step up, make administration responsible, Tell the principal at the school. <laughs> Maybe tell the CTE director why you're sweeping money from one of our funds. Maybe tell the teacher why. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Borhauer. Uh, Ms. Palace Thompson, can we get a uh, follow-up on that and report on just our process uh, in and around this, those dollars and how they get cascade into those programs. Absolutely. We'll have more clarity there, please. Yes, definitely. Thank you. Okay, next speaker is Noel Elliott. Good evening. Thank you for your time this evening. Um, I'm going to be reading a statement. Um, good evening, board members. My name is Noel Elliott. I'm a member of the Centennial Packpackers Board, at the bus booster club for the football program at Centennial High School and my son is a current freshman. I want to speak to you today regarding our situation with our fundraising on our digital scoreboard, which the Packbackers pack purchased last fall. The program um, definitely needed to upgrade the original scoreboard, and we saw this digital system as an excellent way to drive funding for the Packbackers as well as other programs at the school, track band and cheer and soccer. We looked at how digital scoreboards systems were used at different schools around the valley and in the district, including Liberty and Sunrise, who are both have digital score tables in their gyms. We learned that the digital system allowed them to greatly increase their fundraising revenues for their programs. According to the people we spoke to at Liberty and Sunrise, 100% of the revenue raised from advertising sales went back to the booster cup programs. Neither the school or the district were involved in the fundraising revenue or saw any of those funds. This was the same for the revenue raised by selling advertising on their football scoreboards. Schools such as Liberty have a large um, advertising. Just this week, Liberty's football boosters released their fundraising program for 2020 and a top level of 5,000, which includes a ad on the scoreboard. All the revenue will go back to the program and to support the, um, the kids. Now that we have raised and invested over 150,000, we are being told by our administrative team that we cannot begin selling advertising until the district gives us direction on how this is to be done. The school is looking to set specific rules and guidelines on how the revenue will be run and distributed between the different programs at Centennial. This means other schools are already around fundraising and we can't. We understand that the district handles a very large portion of the expenses of sports teams, facilities, and equipment. Unfortunately, the district simply does not have enough to cover everything. Our fo football program had nearly 180 athletes last year, and we actually had to borrow helmets for one of the programs for the, for the past season because we didn't have enough. Our booster program has purchased all the uniforms in our <clears throat> football team for the past 10 years, and we help purchase equipment, meals, gear for our coaches, and many other things in addition to helping cover facilities. While the school has a facility budget, there's just simply not enough to maintain the fields. While normally we can help, this year we can't because we cleared our account in order to invest in that scoreboard. 
until we can begin our fundraising, we are very limited on how we can help others. Based on district policy KHB-R, the school, school district has been not involved in fundraising for clubs and organizations on a school property and gyms. Um, now that we have the scoreboards, the, it seems like the school is trying to manage how we, how we change and how we fundraise for our schools. We are just asking that the school district allow us to begin and then add this as an order of business, which means that we probably can't do it for 2020 season since schools are already out there fundraising. I'm sorry, I tried to hurry. No, no worries. Thank you, Ms. Yes. Ms. Ellie. I, I do know that we have this particular uh, policy on a future uh, agenda, uh, if I'm not mistaken, right? I think, Corey, you, you request. Yeah. So, but in addition to that, outside of that, um, you know, would like to, you know, understand for the, or understand, uh, Friday report is fine, but just to understand um, <coughs> where there may be some inconsistencies in how we're um, executing on this policy. And I, Mr. Sandoval. By the way, I do have attachments from the Liberty School Board to show what they're, so you guys could have them in case you wanted them. We can't really respond, Mr. Sandoval, to public comments. However, um, I, I can share that we are looking at this. It was a donation. We're looking at, at the, um, the capacity of that donation and trying to understand that before we can come up with the uh, determination of how we can, can advertise on it. So we will be getting to that. President Sandoval? Yes, ma'am. Um, and I don't, uh, thank you. I don't know if this is out of order, but I know you're asking for a future report. Can I also add what, um, can you provide information to the board on what training our booster clubs and PTSOs are receiving on education on policy and law and fundraising and how that's executed? Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next up is Denise Stewart. Good evening. My topic is on the fiasco going on with Dr. Sorensen at Centennial. I didn't get a chance to talk last time. My name is Denise Stewart, and I'm the parent of two PUSD students, first at Oakwood and then at Centennial. My youngest, Casey, will graduate this year, and she's been a grateful and active participant in almost every way since she started at Centennial four years ago. We moved our family into this district specifically to send the kids to Oakwood and then to Centennial. We followed two other families who did the same. We all moved from another district just to be in PUSD just because of the schools. I'm also a 25-year realtor in Arizona, and financially I know the value of the schools, districts, the politics that follow them, and the importance of steady and strong support from the teachers, coaches, administrators, and the school board. Say all that to say this. I believe the board has failed to support not only Dr. Sorensen, but in the recent past, other beloved teachers and coaches. And the school board is jeopardizing not only the students, teachers, coaches, and administrators, but by standing by and watching these things happen, you are absolutely affecting our neighborhoods. If I were a young teacher starting out today, looking for a place to settle, this is now one of the last districts I would look to work in. I can't believe I feel this way, this way. But when we voted you to be the ambassadors for public education in this community, and you guys can't even find the decency to answer the students' emails regarding the dismissal of their beloved principal, I wonder if we've chosen the right people in those seats. Many of us have asked for details on Dr. Sorensen's dismissal or forced resignation as it is, and I to this day can only assume it was something personal. Maybe he insulted somebody's mother, maybe he took the last donut out of the break room, we do not know. But what we do know is that if you have failed us, you were supposed to have the backs of the students, the teachers, the coaches, and the administrators. You were supposed to have their backs, and when it got hot in the room, you stabbed them in the back. Without more information, without you being more forthcoming on the details, all we can assume is that there is more to this story. Folks, when you saw the teenagers standing up, speaking up, and caring what was happening to their principal, one of you, just one of you, should have held up a stop sign and said, wait a minute and really looked at what was happening. I imagine that if you could have slowed the train down just a little bit, you would have figured out another solution to this, a different way to settle it. And whatever infraction Dr. Sorensen made, I bet it was something you could have handled differently. Between all of you, all of your experience, and all of your intellect, you could have kept Centennial intact. And you didn't. Instead, you split the community, you activated the kids, and now you've caused distrust between the kids and the authorities that we voted in to protect them. All I can say is I hope that in the future when this happens again, and it will, that one of you will be able to stand up and say to the others, stop. 
we need to take time and we need to really look at this because this is not okay. And I'm telling you, this was not okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Stewart. Thank you. Next up is uh, Katie Fazio. I'm Katie Fazio. I go to Centennial High School, and I'm also talking about Dr. Swartz and about our walkout. I came to Centennial because of the leadership that was being provided by the school. I think the situation has gone a bunch of different ways for multiple different reasons, but I think we're all forgetting what we're truly here for. I think most adults think of kids our age as kids who don't have their opinion and are just following what other kids are saying or are brainwashed by our parents and all the things that we hear around us, but truly every single one of us has our own opinion. And we all think very differently and have different mindsets on different issues. And every parent and teacher and administrator thinks that they have so much pa more power over us, which in some cases they do. But for this type of thing that affects us, the students who go to Centennial, and the students that if we weren't here, Centennial would not even be a thing, our voices were, oh, this has, we have to have a say in this. This has affected every student on this campus. Our voices were suppressed in this entire thing. We did not have a say in anything, and we are not aware of anything. We as students deserve the right to speak up about what we believe in, especially about circumstances that will potentially affect all of our high school's years. Dr. Swanson was the most supporting, loving, caring high school principal I've ever had. From day one, Dr. Swanson did everything he could to make sure the students who attended his school were happy and loved and cared for and being in a good place at Centennial. Every morning at 6.50, Dr. Swanson would stand in front of the school saying good morning to every student who entered campus. There was not one time I saw Dr. Swanson on campus without a smile on his face. You can ask any of the freshmen in this room who I walk with around campus, every single time Dr. Swanson saw me, he would say hello and ask me if I'm doing okay and what I needed to make Centennial a better place. And that's the main reason I came to Centennial. At other schools, I think they're focused on the test scores and how the school itself looks and how they're making themselves look. But Dr. Swanson generally cared about his students, and that is so hard to find nowadays. He watched me down to my elementary school assemblies my eighth grade year, and he would pull me aside and tell me what I, an amazing job I was doing and the impact I was making, and that he really hoped I'd be at Centennial doing the same thing. Dr. Swanson gave me hope and inspired me to truly believe in myself that I could do something so impactful that would change kids' lives forever. He was the main reason I chose to go to Centennial, and now I'm not sure what's going to happen at all. All I know is Centennial lost the best principal I've ever seen, and I'm sure most people in this room can agree. Some parents think of the walkout as us not getting our way, so we're making a big deal about it. But look around you. All these kids and parents spending a Thursday night when they could be doing a bunch of other things, sitting in, loom, in a room listening to people talk about this topic. That's not us being petty about not getting our way. This is about us truly believing something so hard that we will not back down until something has changed. We are always taught as kids to speak up for what you believe in, and I'll continue to speak up for what I believe in because truly this has affected me for weeks, and until something is done and changed, I'll not stand down. This is a misuse of power here, and until this is changed, we'll continue to fight for our voice and fight for what's right. Thank you, Ms. Fazio, um, and, and thank you, as always, to everyone who utilizes uh, this opportunity to uh, express your voice. Um, you know, it is important to us, you know, as a board and as a district to ensure that everybody's voice is heard. I know, you know, last uh, board meeting we talked about, you know, our, our communications and uh, opportunities that we have there in these processes, um, you know, Definitely want to understand where we're at with that, um, you know, as a district. Uh, you know, we've done some things, but uh, I know you can speak more openly to this than I. Thank you. Moving on to the consent agenda. Does any board members have any items that they wish to pull? Go ahead, sir. Um, I wanted to pull 8.6, the gifted scope and sequence. I'll second that. President Sandoval? Yes, ma'am. 8.4, travel requests, as well as 8.10, approval MOU with Arizona Council on Economic Education. Ms. Pingrelli? Yep, Ms. Down. Need a motion to approve the consent agenda minus 8.4, 8.6, and 8.10. Uh, 
I move to approve the consent agenda minus 8.4 or 8.6 and 8.10. I second. Please cast your votes. <coughs> Passes five zero. Okay. Uh, Ms. Saya, we'll go in numerical order. So, Ms. Saya Martinez, travel requests, 8.4. Thank you very much. I do appreciate this. I continue to bring this up, especially when we're looking at funding um, and how items align to our strategic plan. Uh, 8.4 does bring up uh, what caught my attention again is number two, Ironwood High School, sending a group of staff members um, the same, to the same conference as they did last year. I don't know if it's the same one. Do you mind? I appreciate the conversation that we had previously, but enlighten me on what strategic outcomes that they're measuring and how they're going to measure it. So thank you for that, Mrs. Monica Seha Martinez, uh, President Sandoval. Uh, Ironwood High School has begun this year, as, as I understand, uh, to really work on implementing professional learning communities uh, with fidelity. And so it, I believe last year that they sent a group uh, to start that process. And this year is a second group of leadership uh, to be able to come back to the campus and to be able to ensure that they are implementing with fidelity. Within the professional learning community uh, program, uh, there are measurements uh, that teachers and administrators use to ensure that, uh, that, that that program is being implemented with fidelity. Um, and one of the things that I've been working with uh, Mr. Dunham on for the future uh, as we work to um, train the entire staff is uh, bringing uh, trainers to, to the school uh, to be able to train the rest. So this is a group of core leadership uh, and uh, it is important that the principal be there to help lead them through that process uh, as, they, as they continue to define what student success means uh, on their campus. I appreciate that extra. Um, should we anticipate that we're going to send the whole campus or we're going to look for another cost associated with training the rest of the campus? Right, that was my reference to, to bringing, yes. The, the anticipation is, or the expectation rather, is uh, that we would not be sending the entire school uh, to the training, but rather bringing trainers to the school. Perfect. Thank you very much for taking a look at that. That was it. Perfect. Thank you. Going on to 8.6, gifted scope and sequence. Sorry, that was a... Uh... Thank you. Need a motion to approve travel? I move to approve travel as presented. Second. Please catch, cast your votes. Okay, passes 5 0. Moving on to gifted scope and sequence, Ms. Underhill. Yes, I just, I pulled this, I, the document looks great and it's a good description obviously of what we're doing. I just wanted, I, it, in the document um, about the gifted scope, it refers to some surveys and I just wanted to get some possible feedback on what we're hearing from our parents um, about, you know, the gifted services that we're offering in our community and also just um, about the availability of resources and what's happening with our pullout for our K through eight program. So. And I would, it's fine if it's in a Friday report. I just I feel like we haven't heard about gifted in a while, so I wanted to make sure that we called some attention to it. Yeah, I, I think in it. Go ahead, Dr. Bell. I'm sorry, President Sandoval, Governing Board members, uh, Superintendent Palace Thompson. We do have Director Laurie Little here this evening, as well as the Coordinator of Gift, Gifted Education, Lindsey Griggs who can help answer your questions this evening. That said, they have done um, a remarkable job this year in working with a variety of stakeholders 
to really take a look at our gifted uh, services for our students throughout the school district. There's been a comprehensive survey, certainly looking at data. Um, a large task force has been in place. So this has been a goal of not only mine, but certainly of theirs since the beginning of this school year. The scope and sequence document is a required uh, state vehicle. We need to have that board approved. It is attached to our funding, and while it's minimal, we will use um, every cent we can get. There has been a change in what we propose for gifted education. We are proposing a movement away from in-class cluster models to a 90-minute-a-week pullout. All teachers will be trained in problem-based learning with resources during that structure or time period. Laurie Little has engaged the K-8 principals in developing schedules with teachers who are certified in gifted education or who are working on that endorsement who will be um, receiving that training and using those materials. We do have an inclusive model. So during that scheduling period, should other people be identified for engagement in the project-based learning or problem-based learning, um, they would be invited to attend those sessions as well. There'll be, uh, if there are other questions, um, our experts back there uh, have the details. Yeah, no, thank you for that. I think, you know, my question was along those same lines. It's really in and around ensuring that, you know, our teachers are put in a position to be successful, right, and how they delineate, you know, between the curriculum, right? You know, in our, our classrooms, we have uh, excelling students and, and students who, um, you know, uh, certainly maybe not at that level yet, you know, and, and, and ensuring that they're successful in their instruction, which in turn ensures the success of all of our students, right? We would definitely agree with that. Based upon our survey model, the fact that we needed additional professional development and resources for teacher use with gifted students rang loud and clear. So our efforts um, to put that in place and begin that work this spring um, were, was a result of those surveys and the work of the task force. President Sandoval. Um, Ms. Underhill, I appreciate you pulling this out. My train of thought was align this, aligned to this item as well for a, quite a few reasons, and I'm glad that you uh, brought this up. For one, when I think about testing and, and identifying our students, there was a time when I taught, and there are some disparities and underrepresentation of our minorities, ESL students, and special ed. What are we doing? Because looking at the test that's being presented to us tonight does not include nonverbal. Where are we at with that? I'm going to um, ask Laurie Little and Lindsay Griggs to respond. Good evening, President Sandoval. This is Mar Seha Martinez and Governing Board Member Superintendent Pallas Thompson. Thank you for allowing us to share some answers to that. Um, we agree with you completely. The current test, the COGAT, does not um, accurately assess all students. One of the things that Lindsay's really the expert on the testing, so I'm going to pass this over to her in a second. But one of the things that we um, do know that for third through eighth grade students, there are a number of languages. It's an online test, so it, the test can be given in multiple languages. I think it's six, if I'm right, Lindsay. Eight. Eight. Eight, eight different languages. Um, Lindsay has worked really hard, um, along with our parent group that was on the task force, to take a good look at our administrative review. Um, because the students who score, typically they have to score set, a 97% to qualify for gifted in our district, but we're going to be looking at those students that score anywhere from 94 to 97 and maybe doing this administrative review that would include the Torrance test of um, creative thinking and some other nonverbal things for those students that, whether they're EL, we have some nonverbal students that I've worked with them at one of my schools that really have gifted tendencies. And we recognize that there's a lot of under-identified students, and not just in our students with higher EL populations, but even at some of our schools. Um, for example, I work closely with the um, Copperwood 
staff or the principal and administrators there, and I know that they're even under-identified there, so mm -hmm. we have to do a better job. When you look at our enrollment statistics on just on our district site, um, the gifted students range anywhere from having two gifted students at a site to 120. So it's huge. Two gifted students at any of our sites is under-identified. That is um, great data. So I appreciate a couple of things. One, that you acknowledge the eight languages, and which brings me to the question, when we ask parents for permission, those that are second language may not understand. So I would like um, to encourage, and I'm sure it's something that's been talked about, how do we bridge that gap? If it wasn't for my father advocating for me, then I would have never been tested. But he uh, understood what he was reading take a look at those students that are not being represented, uh, where, how are we bridging the gap um, and providing that support to understand the language, to sign, uh, to take the test. We are looking at that, thank you. Thank you. Um, the other piece you highlighted uh, when I had the privilege of being a part of the gifted program. There was a pull-out program. We used to drive to Skyview, uh, and uh, it was a great experience. So when I think about cost and serving our gifted students, funding is, is minimal so what are, what are the thoughts of the pull-up program? What does that look like? Do we have an estimated cost that it's associated with that? How are we going to service those schools that only have two kids? Are we busing them? Um, what, what conversations have been around that? So um, thank you for that question also. What we're looking at is um, not busing students because of cost and also just the comfort of students being on their own campus. So the model that the, we came to the um, decision about through the task force was a multi-age pullout model and like Dr. Bell said there will be a, um, a rubric that administrators and teachers can use together to identify other students that may have a propensity towards creative think thinking and critical problem solving to kind of help fill numbers in those multi-age pullout classes. It'll be happening at their home schools during the school day. Um, and we have some recommended numbers, maybe smaller sizes for the K-4, maybe 20 students. It wouldn't have to be 20. You could have a group of 10, and that could still be some great creative thinking and critical problem solving. So it will be on their home campus. Perfect. And so as you go through this, I would just appreciate uh, not only communicating with the board, but our, a lot of our parents have sent us emails. Mm -hmm. So what's the timeline? What's the phase out uh, of including them, the stakeholders, in this conversation? What are the touch points that are we going to self-reflect? Is it working? Are we pivoting? All those things, and especially cost analysis with those. Yes, thank you thank again, you. President Sandoval, Mrs. Seha Martinez. Um, we do have a timeline um, pending the scope and sequence being approved by the governing board. We'll be getting out more information to our site administrators and teachers and also to parents of all the already identified gifted students. Um, we are just now in the middle of spring gifted testing, so we have a meeting already on the calendar that we're going to, when we send the letters out to parents, have an information session for those parents also. We do have a meeting scheduled for current gifted parents of gifted students to come and do just a question and answer about the new model. So Thank you. that's already scheduled. Awesome, thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, comments around this particular item? No. I just want to thank you guys for your work on this because I know that we have one, one gifted coordinator for our entire district and so it's a pretty massive undertaking. So do appreciate, yes, <laughs> do appreciate your efforts on this and I know that, you know, however we can, we will always all be looking for, you know, different resources and that kind of thing, both at a school level and a district level to be able to, you know, bring some of these pieces together, not just for the kids that test in, but for other kids as well, because it's, it's a neat, that project-based learning is a neat, you know, way to go. So anyway, thank you for thank your Thank you, Mrs. Underhill. We're hoping with some of those students that might join into that enrichment <coughs> block that comes spring testing will be, some of those will qualify. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. So I need a motion to approve the gifted scope and sequence. I move that we approve the gifted scope and sequence. I second. Actually, it looks like it's right. Please cast your votes. Passes 5-0, thank you. 
Moving on to the approval of MOU with Arizona Council on Economic Education. Ms. Aya. Thank you, President Sandoval. I just want to bring attention. The board has made a commitment um, to financial literacy and how important it is uh, that our students uh, be given um, the opportunities to learn personal finance as well as um, economic impact. And we have partnered up for some time with Arizona Council Economic Education, a nonprofit organization that has been teaching our teachers absolutely free on Mondays for quite some time. And here is another um, co a piece of commitment that would support that free professional development on financial literacy. So what better way to uh, continue that um, <coughs> commitment? That was it. Perfect. Thank you. Need a motion to approve the MOU with Arizona Council on Economic Education. I move to approve the MOU with Arizona Council on Economic Education. Second. <coughs> Please cast your votes. Passes 5-0, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right, moving on to the agenda items. Uh, item 10.1, Governing Board Goals. Okay. Any comment from the board um, around what you see in front of you? You want me to start? Yes. <laughs> President Sandoval, thank you. Um, this document has been a work in progress, and I can't stay, say enough the support from our administration and uh, leaning into uh, new dialogue with board goals. In the history of PR Unified, we've never had board goals. And so to communicate yeah. transparency um, at the leadership point, starting with us, we have engage in a lot of conversations, which highlights three goals which the board is ultimately responsible for. Uh, it, around, it surrounds um, ultimately with our vision and mission at the top and our strategic pillars, but the board is responsible for working with the superintendent, and so we have uh, worked on the positioning of establishing and maintaining a positive working relationship with our superintendent and through mutual expectations we will continue to have this as a live document and we will determine collectively what those measurable outcomes um, will be as we move forward but this is a starting point um, the next area that was discussed at our study session was policy the other piece of responsibility the board has is policy um, and what we've identified through this process is that PRA Unified has a lot of unique policies that are different from the state of Arizona um, so they have sta standard or statutes and then there's state policy and then Peoria Unified often has, well that's um, only done in Peoria. So we have made a commitment to look at Peoria Unified policies um, to continue that conversation and meet the needs of our staff and students. And then ultimately the last one is uh, budget. What we prioritize is what we um, will consider, continue to consider what we spend our money on and we've highlighted three, which is compensation, uh, equitable and consistent instructional resources and then develop a multi-year plan to address the facility and program utilization um, situations going on, on our campus and essentially this is a starting point yeah no no agreed and I think one thing um, to, to understand as a board I mean as we take a look at these goals um, and especially that last major category, it's, um, I mean, there's some more information that we still need, right? We have the compensation study that's coming out. We have the facility study. Um, um, some, uh, again, some um, more knowledge that will help us make, you know, informed decisions on, you know, where we actually want to, you know, even create an actual metric, you know, around some of these items. So they, it is absolutely a moving target, but um, I, I think they're in line with, uh, you know, our strategic plan and where we're headed as a district. Ms. Pingrelli, any comment? Uh, yes. Um, well, you know how I like to have quantify, I like to quantitate um, uh, 
what we're getting into. Uh, the superintendent goal um, to establish and maintain a positive working relationship with, excuse me, with the superintendent uh, by defining mutual expectations and so on. I would like to see more of uh, something that can be quantified in terms of like meeting with the board X number of times a year, uh, every quarter. Um, I mean, it, it sounds it sounds nice, but unless you can uh, unless you can come up with uh, if unless you can quantify, quantitate it, then it doesn't really matter. Yeah. So and then same the same thing with uh, and I would like to add we don't have anything on here with student achievement. There's. I mean, to me, the goal of the board, the, the main goal of the board is student achievement and how well our students do. And I don't see it under board goals. And also under budget, the first line, I know last time the first draft had to bring pay in alignment with surrounding districts, and I had brought up what are we going to be giving up in order to bring that pay up? Now it's identify an overarching compensation model for all employee groups with a phased in approach to define compensation outcomes. I just want that explained. Sure. So, so I think, you know, again, for me, you know, when we take a look at these, they, they are uh, agreed very overarching for sure. And I think examples of how we can measure some of these categories going back up to the, the, the superintendent goal, um, you know, I'm wondering if some of the things that you mentioned, which I think are great, um, you know, it would be, you know, in, you know, our superintendent's, you know, review. Um, and even the surveys that we have, you know, as a district. I think all those are, are certainly measures how we um, um, define uh, whether or not the relationship between the board and the superintendent is, is a healthy one. Um, and I, I think even, you know, there's some accountability on our side too, right, to, to commit to, to reaching out to leadership and the sites and, you know, we talked about, you know, really all of our stakeholders, um, you know, that's, that's uh, you know, there's, again, there, there's accountability on our end. But going down to the budget, identifying an overarching compensation model for all employee groups. Um, the reason I, I think when we take a look at the phased approach, you know, again, I, I think there's some more knowledge that we need, you know, around the, the compensation study. But um, I, I think these goals really become focus areas, right? Um, and, you know, the phased in approach, um, as we take a look at it as examples, right, um, would be, you know, our new, our new teachers, you know, would be a focus, you know, again, you know, as we uh, acquire more knowledge, uh, even how we um, allow our staff um, to um, look at paying our staff, you know, over a board-approved um, breaks, uh, which, you know, they currently don't, and, and, and how we could potentially allow them to use their um, discretionary hours, you know, over that time frame. I think those are all, um, I guess, measures and tactics within kind of the overarching goal um, that we can define um, at a future time. But I, I think these are focus areas um, uh, with uh, the understanding that we need some more knowledge to be able to drill down into some of those metrics. Senator? Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I think, you know, this is our first step out in, in establishing these goals. And I think at our discussion, we talked about how we do recognize the need for metrics and that this is sort of a living document. So while these are broad at this time, that we do anticipate identifying some sort of objectives as we go along and get the compensation study and those kinds of things that would fit. And I do think, like you're saying, as far as the um, superintendent review, when we develop that and when we look at those goals, we can add to this. Um, as far as the student success piece, like from my standpoint, we develop these goals um, under the areas where the board is responsible. And these goals should support our overall strategic plan of which one of the pillars is student success. So I feel like if we're able to move through some of these goals and make progress, then we're supporting our overarching strategic plan, which in, in turn supports our students, which is what it's all about. So that's just the perspective that I had from there. Yeah, just to add to that, and, and we've talked about the measurable outcomes because we ask our administrators yeah. for what's their measurable outcomes to those things. When I think about goal area superintendent, and Ms. Pellis Thompson, I'll use you an example. We just approved your goals, and it includes student achievement in that line item. So when I think of the superintendent and defining mutual expectations, 
we're putting the student achievement in her superintendent goals and the board's approving it. The board's held accountable. This is the first time where the board is taking ownership and being held accountable to a goal and the overarching statement is in the goal. The work in, that needs, still needs to be done is defining a quantitative number that we're going to move the dial with our superintendent from ACT scores from 21 to you know two points. And I see that it's captured within our uh, superintendent goals where, where we define those mutual expectations. Does that provide some insight, Ms. Pangarelli, to what you're asking on what? It, it, it does, but I'm, I'm still um, gonna vote no on this because it's not uh, detailed enough. Okay. I'll have to agree with Ms. Pingarelli. The, the wording seems a little convoluted to me. And um, I agree with the general direction. I think it needs a little refinement, a little, little addition in there, here and there. Yeah. Yeah, and I, and I think as we take a look at, you know, where we're at, this phased approach, right? I think this phase one is really approving the, uh, to, to use Ms. Stone's words, uh, the, the general direction, mm -hmm. you know, of, of our goals. Uh, and, and again, as we, we learn more, we can drill down into some of those metrics. This certainly isn't, uh, um, we are not at a point, you know, to be able to define those, but I think these are um, good focus areas for us to, to get moving on um, and, and then define those metrics moving forward. I would agree, and I just I think that this, in some ways, is going to have to be a fluid document. Just as I know that within our strategic plan areas, even you know we're continuing to work, and our administration is working with groups of teachers to <coughs> identify those exit outcomes that you know we're looking for there as well. So I think we just have to kind of move in tandem as we go, but we need to make sure that what we're doing is supporting those. So from my standpoint, I feel like it'd be a good you know, place to start and to keep on moving as we had to kind of develop that level of specificity that we don't really necessarily have right now. Okay. Any other comments? Questions? Yeah. No, I will, uh, I will vote yes when um, it is, uh, there's more detail to it. So that's just my feeling tonight. So I need a motion to approve the governing board goals. I, um, with the preface that it's a living document and that it's moving us forward as we plan our agendas, I move to approve the board goals as presented. Second. So moved. Please cast your votes. Passes, 3-2. Thank you. Moving on, 10.2, Citizens Advisory Committee update. Ms. Myers, good evening. How are you? Good evening. Good evening, President Sandoval, members of the Governing Board, Mrs. Pallas Thompson. Thank you for the opportunity to provide an update on the 2020 Citizens Advisory Committee. On January 23rd, 2020, the Governing Board reconvened the 2019 Citizens Advisory Committee to include prior Governing Board appointed members, as, uh, along with the provision to allow the superintendent to appoint additional members to replace members who were not returning or to increase perspective or expertise if needed. The purpose of the Citizens Bond and Override Committee uh, advisory committee is to make a recommendation to the governing board uh, regarding calling for a bond and or override election uh, Tuesday, November 3rd, 2020 with recommended amounts and or percentages to correspond with each rec uh, respective recommendation. 
The 2020 Citizens Advisory Committee consists of 11 people, seven members returning from 2019, and four new members who are joining the committee this year. There is also representation from across the district, from our southern region through our northern portion of the district from a geographic perspective. Also included in the committee membership are seven parents and community members, as well as four district employees. I've looked around. I don't see that we have any of our citizens advisory um, members with us this evening, but they will be here at a later meeting to be introduced to you in person. The committee and uh, election timeline is typically a 10-month process with committee meetings beginning in the month of February and concluding with a recommendation to the governing board by the end of May. There have been two citizens advisory committee meetings to date. Once the district formally calls for an election, at that point, administration does work with Maricopa County Elections Department during the months of June, July, and August, and the timeline concludes on Tuesday, November 3rd, 2020. The governing board will be made aware of committee meeting progress through written reports uh, from administration following each committee meeting. Minutes from the committee meetings will also be available to the public on the district's website. In addition, committee updates will be provided to the governing board from time to time throughout the process. The governing board, uh, again, will receive a final recommendation from the committee by the last meeting in May. This concludes the Citizens Advisory Committee update. At this time, I can answer your questions and the governing board can also have discussion on the committee. Thank you, Ms. Myers. Ms. Down. Well, I would like to thank all our volunteers that are working on the Advisory Bond and Override Committee and um, I know it's a lot of work, so thanks. Ms. Unreal. I would just echo Mrs. Doan and, and all of our staff that are, you know, along with for that process because I know it's a long process and we've been doing it a lot. So, <laughs> but thank you. Thanks for the update. Ms. Pingarelli. Good. Ms. Seha Martinez. Uh, I would like to uh, thank you. I know the board this year, this time around, asked for a formal uh, board report that you sent out um, just the other day. So, keeping us in the loop um, via email as well. I also saw public relations post it on our uh, Peoria Unified Facebook that these meetings are happening and where's the link. So getting that word out so that parents and our community members can stay more in tuned with that conversation, I do appreciate that extra effort. Um, please let us know if there's anything else we can help with or direction now that you have some board goals to lean into um, and we can help with that process. Well, well, thank you. And President Sandoval and members of the board, I, I have noted in, in the first overview from the meeting, the board, ha or the committee rather, has asked for um, direction throughout the process from the governing board so they can better understand the perspective of the board in regard to uh, the two options that they're considering. So, so with that said, thank you for that. Um, how can we help in that regard, right? Um, so it, it's... You know, one of the things that we've always talked about, um, you know, over the past few years is uh, we've garnered, a, you know, a ton of knowledge, you know, with the, um, the other initiatives that we've gone out for, uh, both from a, a, a demographic perspective, um, a, a political perspective, uh, and even from a needs base. So, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of um, pre-work that we've done uh, that, uh, you know, we can just leverage uh, to be very focused um, and an intelligent about how we go out this year. Um, but how, how can we help, um, you, know, uh, you know, I guess drive that direction for you? Thank you, President Sandoval. I believe uh, direction and input from the committee on, on the questions that are being considered uh, as far as uh, preferences from the governing board would be appreciated. The committee did share that as a request for a future uh, agenda item or communication from the governing board. Perfect. And I think along the lines of uh, Ms. Sayer Martinez from a communication regard, um, I think that's fantastic to uh, make sure that uh, we're casting a very wide net um, as it relates to these meetings. Um, outside of social, or what are some of the other uh, communication channels that we are using uh, to get the word out around uh, these meetings taking place? Public meetings, uh, President Sandoval, so we do post the agenda 
a minimum of 24 hours before the meeting takes place using board docs, similar to what we do with our, our regular governing board meeting. We also have on the district's website a drop down where our community can view the agendas, the handouts, as well as the meeting minutes. But more so, they're welcome to attend our meetings. Tonight, I have uh, provided the dates of the meetings. They start at 4 p.m. They're here at the district office. And so they can attend in person, or they can certainly review the digitized handouts that are available on our website. Perfect. Thank you for that. And last question from a communications regard is, um, you know, we um, our district is becoming more and more diverse, and um, you know, we certainly have some families out there that, um, from a language perspective, uh, Spanish dominant, et cetera. Um, are, do, is, when the communication goes out, um, does it go out uh, in an inclusive manner to ensure that um, all of our stakeholders um, you know, understand what's being said and, and certainly um, give them the opportunity to attend these meetings as well? President Sandoval, we do include on the agenda that if a community member needs uh, assistance uh, to participate in the meeting, we can offer that assistance and we do offer uh, translation if that's requested in advance. Gotcha. So, and, and even from the actual communication that goes out, like on Facebook or um, what have, is it in language in addition to English? It is communicated in the same way we uh, publicize our governing board agendas. President Sandoval, I will add um, to your point. I know at our study session, we when we start talking about other topics, um, block scheduling or other things that we're spending on. I know that the committee meets solely here. I would highly request that you move your location to the northern part and to the southern part so that those community members have access to that conversation at any given point. President Sandoval, if I may. Yes, ma'am. President Sandoval, members of the board, I would also remind our community that the platform that we use for our website can be translated, I believe, into about 23 different languages. Mm -hmm. And so the text that we place, including information regarding bonds and overrides, and there is some new information regarding bonds and overrides up on a dedicated page now that the committee has been engaged. You can go to our website and actually change the language uh, to, to one of many different languages so that all, on the, all of the content on our site is viewable in that format. I think, um, you know, that, uh, thank you for that, by the way, but I, I think the having a, uh, being proactive around that, um, that function you know, of, of our website and, and communicating that to the community um, would uh, would be helpful. Yeah. Versus wait until they get to the website and figure, trying, to, trying to figure that out, right? So, okay, perfect. Any other questions, comments? Ms. Myers, thank you. Thank you. Moving on to 10.3, the second read of policy GCQC, resignation of professional staff members. Dr. Davidson. Good evening, President Sandoval, members of the board community and our staff to the side there. Tonight I am back to try to um, finalize policy GCQC and uh, um, certainly standing here to answer any questions, but and really um, receiving direction tonight, uh, President Sandoval, on uh, how we choose to move forward with liquidated damages as part of policy GCQC. Um, certainly we had direction from some of our board members uh, last time, but I know we're here ultimately to uh, get that to a decision. And, and just wanted to highlight uh, as part of the liquidated damages portion, there's certainly language in our policy, but also we know that liquidated damages um, uh, are also seen in our contract language. Uh, and currently with our certified staff, that's $1,500 and $2,500 for administrators for those employees that uh, break their contract. So certainly I'm just here to, to support the conversation tonight. Thank you. Ms. Ayala Martinez. Uh, fellow governing board members, m my position has not changed since the four years and 10 years I've been as an employee and uh, for 14 years, I've been as a student in this district. Uh, I, we pay our teachers 8 to 20% less than our neighboring districts. That is uh, penalty enough, unfortunately, that they have to go through that process. And the fact that we even consider GCQC to pay, make them pay to leave us is deeply concerning, and I do not support this 
And I have said that consistently, so that's it. I just have a point of order. So and this policy includes things beyond just liquidated damages. So, I mean, we want to approve this policy, but it, it, I mean, it includes other things. So I guess I'm asking what particular action are you asking for? Because <laughs> I, I appreciate Ms. Seha Martinez's point, but I'm not sure that that goes along with this policy. So can you just clarify that a little sure. bit? Sure, yes, ma'am. Ms. Underhill, President Sandoval, members of the board. What we know is there is a portion of GCQC, right, that is that revolves around liquidated damages, but you're right. There are other pieces to that policy regarding benefits uh, when you leave the district um, after a certain period of time, retirement, those type of things. So certainly we come tonight with uh, the desire for you to view this as a second read in the way it's presented. You certainly could make a motion to modify things that you see not just to liquidated damages. If you happen to study other portions of the policy, you could do that and give direction accordingly. Um, but by no means would I recommend that we remove the entire policy of GCQC. President Sandoval, thank you, Ms. Underhill. And I was referring to what's highlighted and be presented, so thank you. Ms. Pingarelli. All right, um, Dr. Davidson. I just want to go through the, the timeline because on the, the near the bottom of the page, it gives a uh, like a prorated amount for liquidated damages. So contracts are issued around the middle of March. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, employees have 15 days to sign, so yeah. they have to about April 1st to sign. With spring and spring break in there, Ms. Pingarelli might be might be a little bit longer, but yes, 15 okay. work days. Yep. All right, and then the way we have it, the way it's written here, is then the employees have from April 1st to May 30th, so they have about two months. Um, if if they were to leave, um, to have no liquidated damages, is that correct? That the is the way how it's it is. written. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, are we early in in giving contracts? Are there other districts that give contracts earlier than this? Yes, ma'am. There are currently many districts that have already gone out with their contracts for next school year. Okay. So if we have no liquidated damages until May 30th, um, so an employee after sign two months after signing the contract can leave without any penalty, um, what is our chances of getting the best teacher at that point in the year? Generally speaking, the longer we wait to hire an employee, the slimmer the, the employee pool is, right? Um, so I, I think the reason why we presented it this way tonight, Ms. Pingarelli, is that in our current um, scenario, our budget team doesn't usually recommend um, salary adjustments, things like that, until later in the year. Um, and so I know that Again, seeking feedback from the board and in previous conversations, we wanted to ensure that a, a, an employee who's been with us, who wants to be with us, certainly can secure their job early. But if for some reason has a, a, just a tremendous opportunity elsewhere, we wouldn't penalize them for that if our budget team hadn't made a decision in a timely fashion. Um, but, but again, that was a, a roundabout way to tell you the longer we wait, the harder it becomes for us to get the, the best employees out there. Okay. And then the, I know we discussed this last board meeting, um, for liquidated damages for internal or external uh, advancement to a position with uh, increased responsibility that they're waived. Um, I had said before, uh, I'm on the board for Peoria, not on other districts, so I, I, I'm not uh, in favor of the external advancement. If it's internal, that's great but not external. Um, I appreciate uh, 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 President uh, Sandoval and his uh, uh, trying to, uh, I, I know we had discussed this over the p past four years. Uh, it has gone down $1,000 per each uh, classification. Um, right now, this policy involves only 20 to 30 um, teachers and admin per year on average. Um, I am for keeping the way it is and Ms. With, without these changes. 
Yes, ma'am, and I just want to just add a little bit to the data. Um, when we say it impacts it, from, a, from the amount of people that are charged liquidated damages, mm -hmm. you are correct. I would tell you, uh, Ms. Vesley and I and team um, certainly do have uh, many employees that are impacted by the policy as it relates to those, those indicators moving out of country, state, right. so forth, right. you know, health reasons. So that, that, that portion certainly does impact a lot of employees. But, right. Yeah. yeah, the only ones that, that <laughs> yeah, I know we're, we're talking about is just the liquidated damages that um, when they don't fit into those yes, classifications. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Pigarelli. Ms. Unreal. Um, and I spoke about this last time too, and that I feel like you've come a long way. I mean, you've worked really hard to listen to the the feedback that we've get, been given about how the way that this poli was, policy was written, it was kind of a one size fits all, and we know that that's not the situation with our employees, and neither is you know leaving in the middle of the year versus you know not completing a contract that you haven't even started in. So I appreciate you know those parameters that you've l outlined here, and I think that, that you've done a really good job of making sense of that. Um, we also did have a representative from our teacher community speak up last time and, and kind of voice her approval of the steps that had been taken in this direction. Um, so from my standpoint, I feel like we're getting there. Um, regardless, you know, about the situation of liquidated damages, for me, it's, it feels like we're listening to our employees. We're trying to make sure that we have a good fit within this policy, both for protecting our students and also protecting and, you know, serving our employees. So I feel like we're, we're taking a step. It may not be all the way there, as Ms. Sam Martinez would like to see, um, but I feel like within, you know, where we're headed, I think we're, we're moving in the right direction. So I would like to go ahead and approve this policy with the changes that are evident. Thank you for that. Ms. Stone? Well, um, like Ms. Martinez, I haven't changed my opinion on this. I, I don't think that um, there's any need for changes to our, our GCQC policy um, as, as it stands. And the fact that we have spent so much time on this when it is not that impactful is embarrassing to me. Um, this, this, it, it's not, this is not, um, I don't think it actually would help that many of our teachers. I don't think that it is respectful of them. It's like we don't expect them to live up to their word. Um, I think um, the external advancement, I agree with Ms. Pingarelli, that we want to keep them here. And, and hopefully they're professional enough to put their feelings aside when they're dealing with the children. Um, they signed the contract, and I believe that um, the liquidated damages, and there are, you know, there are all kinds of language in there about the superintendent being able to um, assess these things, and, and um, I'm sure they're paid attention to on a case-by-case -case basis because they're not that many. So I'm, I'm for keeping it um, without any of these changes. Thank you, Ms. Stone. So... Um, this is a policy that uh, you know. It's a, you know, in 2017 that that I pulled for a couple of reasons. Um, one being that um, it uh, it's from a language perspective, it it definitely seemed more punitive than supportive um, of a policy to our teachers and staff and and admin, right? Um, I, I was certainly happy that we were able to reduce the damages by a thousand dollars across the board. Um, but, um, you know, it still ha needed some work, you know, as it relates to protecting the classroom while valuing, you know, our, our teachers and staff, which I think these new changes do that. Um, you know, it is understood, you know, that the relationship that our students have, you know, with their teachers is, is so critical to their success in the classroom. Um, so, you know, when we do have a teacher leave, you know, mid-semester, uh, it's not only a big impact on them, but also their, their peers um, to, to kind of pick up the, the slack, if you will. 
So and I, I, we've heard um, individuals you know, talk about this policy and um, the, that it keeps, um, potentially keeps um, teachers um, here who, who may not want to be here. But I think this new edited version, you know, um, uh, certainly overcomes uh, that particular hurdle. So, um, I mean, with, you know, Ms. Pingarelli speaking to the, the internal external um, advancement, I mean, I, I think for me, I mean, I would, uh, I would be okay with uh, striking the external investment, but outside of that, um, you know, I would like to, you know, move that we approve this, you know, minus the uh, reference to the external um, uh, movement, you know, of our, uh, our teachers. So that said, any other comment, questions? I do have another question. Um, when reading it, it says, um, liquid, uh, the last paragraph here that's highlighted, liquidated damages can also be prorated dependent on the time of the school year in which the employee breaks their contact. And then, for example, and then it says, will be assessed full liquid, and, and, and then it says, will be. So is it can be or will be? <laughs> Ms. Doan and uh, Governing Board, uh, certainly maybe you have caught me on semantics there. Um, usually our policy um, would read may or shall, right? Those are some terms you would commonly see. So um, certainly if you would like to give direction on that, we can uh, well, change that. But I would say uh, in, from an HR perspective, will is, is how we typically act, right? Because it's our policy and that's what we follow. Right. Um, but I, I'm certainly open for your guidance on that. It just seems to me like can be is like, well, we might do that, and then sure. we will, as we will. So if we could have the language kind of unified there. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Yeah. Um, I just have one more comment. On the internal external advancement, I don't think that we should strike external advancement because I don't think that we should be known as a district that doesn't want our people to go on to higher levels and do different things, even if they can't do it here because we don't have the position available at times. So I don't know, from an educator standpoint, I don't, I don't ever want to like limit my you know, students or people that are working with, that I've invested in from another opportunity, especially if we don't have one here. So to me, I don't think striking that is, I don't feel like that's necessary, but that's just me. No, and, and thank you for that. I, I think for me, you know, one of the things that we talked about last time is, you know, having somewhat of a uh, um, an, an additional statement around the external advancement, you know, allowing for the external advancement to, to take place without assessing the damages, um, you know, for an associate who's maybe been here for, you know, seven, ten years, right? Um, you know, and that's, I, I think, you know, that's, you know, we talk about investing in our associates um, and an individual who's been here for, their, for that many years, you know, I, I agree. I mean, I'm for their uh, advancement uh, moving on and, um, you know, we need to celebrate that and hang our hats on the fact that, uh, you know, we help develop them to, to be able to realize that. And when we talk about, um, you know, walking billboards and individuals who will, you know, tell other teachers or new teachers, you know, why PUSD, that would be one of the reasons. Ms. Ayat, it looked like you had a, another comment, sorry. No, you're good. Okay, gotcha. So I do need a motion to approve GCQC um, as presented. I move that we approve GCQC as presented with the changes that are highlighted. I'll second that. So we've got uh, two nays, two yeays, and eight abstentions. So the motion does not it fails. Carry it fails. Yep. Dr. Davidson, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Moving on to informational reports. 11.1, budget, facilities, planning, and construction. Uh, 
And these are also seen on our website. Report on upcoming meetings and events. Good evening, President Sandoval, members of the board. First of all, quick update on our Ironwood Eagles. Uh, it looks like uh, it's really close um, with the, the sunny slope with 22 and the Eagles with 21. So it's going back and forth just a little bit. Not that I'm focusing on that more than the board meeting, but <laughs> did want to bring you that quick update. A couple things I want to draw your attention to related to upcoming meetings and events. Something else taking place actually right now. We do have a presentation going on also at Liberty High School from Colin Karchner uh, just want to remind our board and our community that we did have him a uh, speaker related to social media and screen time uh, with children and he was speaking to a number of our students this week as well as uh, parents during two parent meetings that were taking place so uh, we appreciate all the insight that he was providing to our community uh, you've got upcoming meetings and events it's busy busy time of year uh, we have our patriotic speech contest taking place next week and then shortly after that our Peoria Education Foundation is celebrating our scholarship recipients at the Peoria Sports Complex. And so uh, that is uh, thanks to their support that we are uh, awarding, or they are awarding a number of uh, scholarships to our high school graduating seniors. So a record number this year, and we look forward uh, to uh, sending you all of that information. Uh, also, this week we met with our Superintendent Student Advisory Council, and a member of that Superintendent Student Advisory Council is actually here with me. I should have introduced introduced her uh, earlier this evening, but Hayden Gardner, and of course she led us in the pledge this evening, student body president at Centennial High School. So I want to thank her for joining us here. Perfect. Thank you, board members. Any items on that um, calendar that you do not see that you'd like to announce? No? Perfect. Thank you, Ms. Harry. Legislative, state, and local updates. Good evening again, President Sandoval, members of the Governing Board. This year's legislative session has passed a critical date, and the time to hear House bills in the House and Senate bills in the Senate has passed with the exception of Appropriations Committee and Strike Everything Amendments. School districts are hearing that the budget may be passed in the next few weeks and will be sent to the Governor's desk for signature, but this timeline is unfortunately not guaranteed. In addition to the legislative session moving along quickly, so is Arizona's economy. In fact, Maricopa County ranked number one in the nation for job growth from December of 2018 to December of 2019, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. The ranking came from the addition of just under 90,000 jobs here in the county, and the largest gains were seen in transportation and utilities, education, and health services. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Else, Thompson? Anything to add? No, we're good here. Okay. Perfect. District budget report uh, for the month of December 2019. Again, items that are on our website. District enrollment report for the month of December 2019. also can be found online. Moving on to other business, uh, board member opportunity to readdress re agenda items. Any items that you'd like to readdress? No? No. Okay. okay. Draft agenda for the March 12th, 2020 regular board meeting. Still being worked on. And request for agenda items for future governing board meetings. Ms. Seha. Thank you, President Sandoval. Um, at the beginning, we had uh, a parent request or uh, a guest, a public speaker. I wanted to add to the financial request that you made about the finances when we talked about um, CTE and funding, and you asked for the report. I would also like to just to add to that information report. Um, how our administrators uh, are educated on their own site school budget. Um, it concerns me that an administrator didn't know where money went. So what is their process on how they're educated um, and it as it aligns to the policy? So just to add to yours. Um, and then one more. So as long as that gets a second. Second. 
And then I would like to request a study session with the board to discuss a one, three, five year plan to address the overcrowding of the northern schools and low enrollment in our, de uh, in our declining schools. I'll second that as well. Ms. Pingrelli? Yep. Ms. Underhill? Yep. Ms. Stone? No. Good. So the only item I have is, uh, you know, in this, in this category, I'd like to convene an executive session just to discuss um, uh, our overarching process on placing associates on administrative leave. Thank you. I'll second. All right, 13.1, need a motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn at 7.32. I can't. So moved, thank you. So my son called and tells me, apparently, apparently his, 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 his mother is claiming her on the taxes.